our next <laughs> guest, it's online. Uh, he's Sir Jai Bushman, uh, coming from Zaha Hadid uh, Studio of Architects. He's the co-founder and the director of the research group in Zaha Hadid Code, and he's interested in fabrication and structurally informed design technology. He's studying also a doctorate uh, with the block research group at Zurich, and we are going to, to listen uh, what they do in architecture using uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. Please welcome uh, Shajai Bushman with a huge clap. Um, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, can I start? Okay, so um, I'm gonna talk about uh, architectural intelligence. And <clears throat> it's our version of, uh, you know, what we think of uh, application of uh, computational technologies, digital technologies, and how it can uh, help, uh, how it can be applied in a creative profession uh, uh, like, like architecture and other design professions. Um, productively to, to align technology with engaging and responsible design. Um, and I've been very fortunate, like in, in, in my career so far, like I've been with Zadid Architects for a bit over 15 years. Um, but at the same time, uh, I've been also teaching uh, at the Architectural Association uh, Design Research Lab, and I've also been pursuing scientific research at uh, ETH, as was mentioned. So I've been very fortunate to, to have a ringside view, uh, an intimate view of like leading professional research and academic arenas. Um, and, and so these, these are the three hats I continue to wear um, and which informs like my view of like the relationship between technology and design. And um, so in that sense, uh, most of you, uh, most most of you might be familiar with this aspect of like the, our company, like Zadid Architects, uh, kind of known for these socially engaging, visually engaging, experientially engaging physical buildings, um, like this airport in uh, uh, Beijing that was opened a couple of years ago, uh, where a lot of visitors just come to see the building and not necessarily to take a flight. Um, and at, at around the same time, like also like this uh, tower with the world's tallest atrium was constructed. Um, but what I, what I want to highlight is that like technological investments for like these kind of achievements or uh, accomplishments uh, were all, already started when I joined the company like 10, uh, 15 years ago, um, uh, even though the projects were completed like in 2020. So uh, I think in that sense, uh, I would like to talk to you about like a little bit of the behind the scenes of like what our current uh, focuses are uh, for the next generation of uh, architectural projects that the, the Bureau would do. Um, so like the research team that I'm leading, like we are particularly interested uh, in computer graphics and computer geometry. Um, uh, in, because it's expressive and designer friendly and so on. Um, in addition, like we're interested in uh, the robots and robotic uh, manufacturing, uh, but also creative use of robots uh, to create uh, novel uh, expressions. Uh, and lastly, we are increasingly interested in video game worlds, like in video game technologies um, and like uh, particularly interested in combining these three things like geometry, uh, robots, and video game worlds uh, to to address like real world uh, challenges facing the building industry and uh, ch challenges facing the architecture industry, the engineering industry, and the construction industry, the so-called AEC industries. Um, and uh, part of the challenge is uh, that like a lot of buildings are constructed either in F, uh, with resource uh, ineffectively, like a lot of resource consumption and pollution, but more importantly also that buildings uh, get demolished uh, prematurely because 
um, they're not designed to be adaptive over time or people uh, don't have much agency on when things are built and how they're built uh, and so on. And therefore they end up not having uh, much liking for the building. And so the buildings have to be uh, demolished uh, prematurely. And, and uh, part of the argument is that like 20th century architecture has uh, treated buildings as cars and cities as machines to live in, privileging automation and universality. And to the extent that like cities like this, Atlanta um, have uh, dominated like the 20th century urbanism and uh, architecture they were designed for the motor car and less for human experience. They were designed for logistics uh, rather than uh, human inhabitation primarily. And con contrast that like with like city like Barcelona, like which is dense and it is pedestrian friendly and human friendly um, to the extent that in, in uh, the 20th century cities like Barcelona, like kind of fell out of like public favor, uh, kind of thinking of uh, uh, that was the extent of influence of 20th century architecture and modernism designed for the car and so on. Uh, but reality bears a complete opposite uh, evidence, like city like Atlanta, same population as Barcelona, order of magnitude, more carbon footprint. Um, and and because and that's very easy to see. It takes more per capita to heat a uh, sprawl city, uh, more commute, uh, more infrastructure needed, and so on. So, how can we get back cities like Barcelona, basically? Um, so we we need to think, start thinking about like buildings as not for cars but for people, and cities are not as machines but as hosts, uh, hosts for our, our activities. Uh, human activities, human interactions, like and all the things that we like to do in cities. And so move away from a focus on automation and universality and focus on like material and energy conservation and adaptive uh, building so the city can adapt as, as, as it changes, as it evolves. So we think like there needs to be two significant changes to achieve this. And the first major change is how we design and how we build. Um, and in, in fact, uh, this is where we think like geometry and robots can play a significant role. Um, uh, and one of the ancient wisdoms, like for example, like uh, of conserving material and, and to be effective with material, like is to use, to arrange materials in specific geometric shapes like arches and domes and walls. And, uh, and more particularly arranging materials in relation in specific geometric patterns like these bricks are aligned in a specific way. They're not horizontal. They, they are particularly uh, uh, configured in this way so that they can be structurally most efficient. So very, and this ancient wisdom uh, of arches and domes and walls and also aligning material in a very specific way in relation to force flow um, is also compatible with modern day technology of 3D printing, uh, particularly 3D concrete printing. So um, where, whereby like a modern, so you can see the similarity between masonry and 3D printing in this case. And, um, and, and like block research group where I'm doing my PhD has been incorporating these principles of like wisdoms of masonry design and uh, incorporating them in like modern day building components like the floor slab here um, and, and the specific geometric pattern on the top and the arch at the bottom together already makes uh, for the floor slab to be about 70% lighter and 25% in space saving. And you can imagine how much more effect each of these floor slabs can have if we replace a, a lot of the floors in, in uh, future buildings. And recently we collaborated with Block Research Group and Zadid Architects, including Incremental 3D and Holdsim, uh, to create this prototype footbridge uh, in con using 3D concrete printing. And what is unique about this bridge is that it is entirely dry jointed. There is no glue, there is no uh, mortar between all of these bl uh, blocks. So it's basically like treating 3D concrete printing as artificial stone. And so, um, so there is no steel anywhere in the, in the bridge, neither in the concrete nor in the cable uh, running through it. 
and there's only steel is at the at the feet and the cable that connects all of these like so the advantage of incorporating these ancient principles of masonry and dry construction is that this can be entirely dismantled uh, which actually in fact it has been dismantled and crushed uh, and recycled um, uh, so so using these ancient principles and modern design techniques uh, we can achieve like some of the circular printing circularity goals like how to reduce material how to design uh, structures for reuse and recyclability and repair um, so because it there is it's a dry joint we can also repair parts of the blocks if some there is damage and and so on um, so altogether like there is a positive combination in combining design technologies and ancient wisdoms of uh, building construction uh, and upgrading and making it available for uh, the 21st century. And the second change, uh, which is also a very important change, is, is changing who decides on what gets built, where it gets built, and how big, etc. Um, and in other words, to have users have some agency in the built environment, which currently they don't, because like even though the built environment affects us all very deeply, like none of us can actually decide uh, when and how things are built and uh, and so on. So this is where we have deep interest in computer games um, or video games uh, and adapting that to to architectural use. Why? Because Video games uh, fundamentally represent users. Uh, you may be surprised to know that like none of the computer the design technologies have any representation of a user. Uh, they, they represent doors and walls and, and so on and, and all the physical things, but they don't represent user and what the user wants. Uh, whereas games, on the other hand, like fundamentally are built around the user. There's a concept of a user and, and more importantly, there's a concept of user choices. So, like, so that's where we want uh, we want to incorporate architectural technologies within uh, gaming technology. So, like, so we're building uh, a lot of these kind of prototype applications uh, where we are incorporating uh, our knowledge of how to design and how to build better into video games, so that like we can. Uh, have more engagement with the end user ultimately. So it's not like only professionals designing with a hypothetical user in mind. Um, so, and, and as a natural consequence of this, like there's, there's automatic design for choice. Like, so it's not one, uh, one particular option, like the many, many possible uh, outcomes. Um, so when we combine these two as these three aspects, like on the one hand, material uh, and energy conserving shapes like the walls and domes and so on and robotically made building parts um, and with end user participation end user choice uh, we, we we can then create um, a architecture where one size doesn't need to fit all like it can it can vary according to uh, individual budgets individual preferences and so on or at least user group preferences um, and so that can so each each outcome is customized not only to the location in the physical space but it's also customized to the end users and what's also interesting about like this combination is that like one style need not fit all so for example if the demographic changes if the user group changes from a urban knowledge worker to to more uh, com communities which are more uh, craft oriented and so on uh, we can if the relationship between people and the end users change, the parametric architecture can adapt and like we can produce a new kind of uh, architecture, uh, uh, which is more suited for that particular community. So, so one style need not fit all or one, uh, neither should one size fit all, uh, all communities of users. So while all of this looks like uh, this should be a no brainer, why isn't industry actually doing this? Uh, because industry is still pursuing uh, this idea that we can learn from the automotive industry. Um, they're still thinking of buildings as a product. They're still thinking as buildings as like some kind of um, immediate service that can be installed in any, any location in the, in the world. Um, and this is not a very old, uh, very new idea. Like there have been previous attempts 
to think of buildings as like as though they're cars uh, and think of like all the parts that go into the building um, and 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 uh, and automate all of it and integrate the production of it uh, as a uh, as a factory uh, which which is what exactly Google tried to do in in Toronto uh, this the famous Toronto keys project which is actually it's a they had very lofty and novel um, goals of how to reduce cost of living how to implement efficient transportation and efficient energy use etc uh, and they also spoke about uh, how how to have a library of parts, a kit of parts, uh, and how those kit of parts can be combined into design features and design spaces. And not only that, like how the kit of parts can be, um, uh, how it, they can be produced and sourced from a, sustainably from a forest. Uh, and more inf importantly, how all of that can be combined into a kind of, uh, how, how they can be manufactured in a factory. So basically, they're talking about digital design for manufacturing and uh, uh, assembly, like the A component, the job, um, and, and then also B, which is the manufacturing in itself. Um, and they also spoke about public engagement, like uh, through extensive surveys and community engagement conversations, etc. So they did talk about all the right things. Uh, nonetheless, it, it, it wasn't successful and the project had to be um, uh, stopped. And, and, and we feel like that like part, part of the issue here is thinking of buildings um, as like a product like, and, and, and not having people not having any agency to, to affect the built environment is one of the issues. Um, and uh, uh, whereas architecture is more like healthcare and more like education because it's a human system. There are like lots of uh, humans involved in, in the decision making and it's not just uh, about automated production. And it also shares uh, additional features like there's a lot of inertia about changing what already exists uh, because there's high risks involved like and it's a highly regulated uh, industry. So, um, and there's also typically disconnect between users and stakeholders and like the people investing into production of buildings. Um, and also it, it's a very uh, slow cycle to innovate. Uh, there's not very easy to change the industry uh, and so on. So in, in all these features, it shares uh, commonalities with education and healthcare. And another, another issue uh, is, is that construction industry is predominantly made of small, medium businesses. Um, and so where, when Google tried something like, you know, we can see why they tried that because 1% of uh, all the businesses in, in, in the AEC industry is, is large, uh, whereas they control uh, more than 40% of the annual revenue of the industry. So Google can see like, or players like Google can see that if you disrupt 1%, you're automatically capturing 40% of the, of the market. But whereas like 99% of the industry is actually small and medium businesses and they control about like 60% of, of the revenue. And so what, what, how can we think about what can we design for that that segment uh, uh, because small and medium businesses cannot operate like the same way large businesses can operate. So, um, so we are saying counter to the centralized model where there is like a lot of efficiency uh, to integrate all the parts, like think of it, thinking of buildings as automobiles, there are some benefits to it, of course. Uh, we are also thinking like there can be a complementary participatory model, which is a bit more hybrid and, and more suited for the small and medium uh, uh, businesses. So when we, uh, as an example, we tried uh, this participatory model in, in a project that we implemented, or we are currently implementing in, in Honduras. Um, it is, uh, why did we go all the way to Honduras? Like, uh, because like the building industry is very regulated and like very risk averse. Uh, so we wanted to do this proof of concept in a slightly more uh, positive environment. Um, and um, so we, what we tried to showcase there that like we can have all the efficiencies of modular construction and factory made buildings. 
but also address some of the shortcomings. One of the major shortcomings of like factory made buildings is that it's difficult to adapt it to a given site. It's difficult to adapt it to a given climate. So, um, so what we did was that like we want to retain the efficiency of modular construction, but like adapt it to local terrain and local climate uh, using. Uh, and so we developed the, the, these kind of software tools, data-driven tools uh, to help customize uh, objects to the terrain and climate. And, and the second thing like is, uh, where, is uh, where we wanted to improve modular construction is designing for choice. Like it, it, um, and that means like as architects, it's a lot more work for us, right? Like we, we don't know what choices like the user may make. And so we need to already predict for every choice that the user makes, like there is a corresponding architectural uh, solution. Like, so, so that's the idea that the user picks uh, voxels or pixels and like we, uh, we automatically generate these kind of uh, design options. And, um, and so again, there's similarity with the Google approach here that like the, the, the wide variety of possibilities is basically uh, coming from a standard kit of parts like that are assembled and combined in very different ways. Um, uh, to create all these options. Um, so they're not all individually manually designed, like so there is a lot of algorithmic uh, combinations here. And the combinations, of course, come from a kit of parts and each one of those have been engineered uh, so they can be manufactured uh, and, and manufactured effectively and, uh, and, and, uh, and so on. And one of the innovations we did, we, we did on the manufacturing part is not to think of a large gigafactory, but to think of importing just small machines and using local, uh, local timber and local tradespeople, lo local skill labor to, to, uh, to construct something that is much bigger. So it's like not full automation, it's like technology upgrade of like skilled workers on the island in, in Roatan in Honduras. And so part of this idea is like not a gigafactory, but a micro factory and, and digital upskilling of the labor. And so what this allows us on the design side is to make a good estimation of like how much time and effort is needed to convert raw material from its basic form into a house. Um, and so that, uh, so that gives us more information and removes some of the risk involved uh, in, in, in planning this process of converting raw material into, uh, into the house. And, uh, and ultimately all of this information, uh, we, we incorporate it into a game like Logic. Uh, we are using Unreal Game Engine here where people can uh, choose not only where the house is, like in 3D space, they can choose uh, where they want to locate their house, but then they can also customize the interiors like to, to their preference. And, and um, not only that, like an instantaneously walk around and see uh, more intuitively what they can see outside of their house, how much of the, the view of the beach they have, et cetera. And, and most importantly, every decision that they make is reflected and there is feedback on the cost and what are the environmental implications and, and so on. So we have tried to make a gamify a very uh, into, uh, usually uh, non-intuitive process and try to make it as intuitive as possible. And so what that means for the buyers is that it is very transparent like it, and, and it makes uh, makes uh, personalized investment uh, like one of the largest investments anybody can make is, is a house and like so by making it more intuitive and more transparent like we are kind of de-risking uh, the investment for, for the buyers um, and, and in one of the consequences of this gamified approach was, uh, was this kind of idea of like what are the individual preferences so we as architects and designers could see that these 11 buyers, they all prefer to buy the bookends and not, nobody wanted anything in the middle uh, and nobody wanted anything on the bottom. Um, so we could aggregate these personal preferences and, and, and of course there are conflicting choices because many people want the same, same house. Uh, so we as designers then kind of disassembled all their choices and reassembled it to satisfy as many preferences as possible. So original design was like on the top 
where people wanted as many uh, uh, bookends as possible, side views. And so we reconfigured the house to the bottom layer so that there are as many uh, bookends as possible. So, uh, so that, that was another benefit of like this kind of gamified approach that like we could uh, redesign quickly to, to satisfy as many user preferences as possible. Uh, yeah. Um, and lastly, like to de-risk, uh, we, we also de-risk for the investor uh, because like they ahead of time know what, what of the units already are popular, what, what the users want. So in this case, we knew like this particular unit type was the most popular and we then decided to design it much further. Um, and it's also better for architects and suppliers because we now have a very clear idea of what the user wants and we can spend engineering effort and design development effort on the ones that actually work and the ones that the users want and not like something uh, that they don't want. Um, so that is that is where we are at like and, and uh, we are able to offer efficiencies of mass construction and also individual buildings. Uh, through this gamified process. And uh, so far we aim to have a pilot community of 10 houses uh, completed by the middle of next year. And um, we hopefully can showcase uh, a positive future where uh, there is participation, uh, people can engage with their built environment, but also use material conserving uh, and novel forms of uh, construction. Uh, to, to create like a more vibrant, sustainable community, which is spatially interesting and engaging as well. Um, so to conclude, uh, we wanted to retain a, a large amount of like the benefits of modular construction that Google had tried in Toronto, uh, but like kind of uh, adapted uh, to, to the specifics of the, the construction industry. Um, so things like replacing the gigafactory with a micro factory and, and community engagement with this kind of gamified approach, uh, which people can customize and be involved in the construction of their house uh, and so on. So um, in, in other words, like we are trying to transform like the 21st, uh, 20th century focus on automobile and production line, et cetera, uh, and like how the automobile became a central to the lifestyle, how, how to change that and, and think of it as a more holistic system of, uh, uh, of vocabulary of local material and techniques, uh, understanding of family uh, preferences and user preferences and combine it with uh, uh, mass, mass production. Uh, so in other words, like look at another a reference from the 20th century, the so-called case study houses uh, of, of Los, Los Angeles rather than the automobile and, um, and, and to look forward to a positive, engaging and responsible future. Uh, with that, I thank you for your attention and I'm open to any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Shadi. It was very inspiring to see how you are uh, reimagining architecture uh, through gamification, video games, new technologies. Uh, it was very surprising. Um, I don't know if anyone has a question. Um, otherwise, I have one quick question. That is, uh, you had in, in a project, uh, you were using artificial intelligence. Uh, you were using also artificial intelligence in this project in Honduras to create connection with the community, or it was a completely different um, focus? Well, yeah, I mean, it, so our approach to AI is like that, that it is a, the basis is a geometric intelligence, right? That, uh, so we are interested in like learning about uh, applying AI technologies, machine learning technologies to understand shape, uh, particularly shapes that are uh, beneficial for structural purposes uh, or, or they save material. Um, and so there's that kind of intelligence that like we want to incorporate into, in, uh, into our machine learning and so on. Uh, so some traditional design 
uh, skills. Um, and and so and the other thing that we want to uh, use ga uh, AI for is this kind of participation aspect, uh, like what kind of choices might uh, might the users make, like to predict um, ahead of time, like uh, like what kind of uh, outcomes they they may prefer. Um, so in in both the projects that I've shown, like we. Uh, you know, we are at early stages pre preparing for the use of AI and preparing for the use of data, data driven methods. Um, so that's what I wanted to highlight to, to be able to use AI and to be able to use machine learning techniques like we first have to uh, incorporate like some of the wisdom uh, of traditional uh, architecture and cities like urbanism like 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 things that are embedded in cities like uh, Barcelona, like or the Sagrada Familia, uh, you know, there's a lot of pre-computer intelligence that we should inherit first uh, before, uh, like applying uh, a new, uh, new, new technologies. Let's say. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you for being You're here. Welcome. You're welcome. Thank you so much.